Thank you, Alison. Um, and thank you to James for uh, this invitation. Um, I hope you can hear me okay. If not, wave your hand or something. Okay, uh, James has mentioned that this is a very interesting topic. Well, this topic of Brexit. And uh, I have a few other words that I could use to describe it um, in addition to interesting. Uh, but we have a, a time limit here. So um, the, this, uh, we've been asked to speak on Brexit, an opportunity or challenge. And uh, so I want to look at the challenges uh, presented by Brexit for research and researchers. And I know that here in this room we have um, a mix of researchers from doctoral students to perhaps postdocs and academic staff. So the broad range is covered there. Um, now, um, for those of you who, uh, and I will spare you very little detail here, uh, but for those of you who maybe are not so familiar with Brexit, I thought it would be useful for me to make a couple of contextual remarks, but, but I won't give you a long lecture on all of this. Um, so, the referendum in June 2016 opened the process uh, for the UK to withdraw from the European Union. And this was after 43 years of membership. Now, I mention this point because um, being in a club like the European Union, which is a very complex, very uh, multi-dimensional multi political organization. So withdrawal from this kind of club is not ever going to be easy. It's going to be, it's complex. Uh, and of course, um, in international organizations, you know, where states are members, withdrawal is always, a po is always possible and countries do leave international organizations. And that kind of process is covered by some provisions in international law. So in a sense, this, this is kind of in one way not unusual. However, in the case of um, the European Union, uh, there are additional um, complications. Um, now, uh, another thing which I should sort of say here is that um, it, it wasn't, you know, the, the, the sort of idea of, of withdrawal was not there in, in the European Union treaties from the, in the beginning. So it wasn't there in the original founding treaty, uh, the Treaty of Rome, or in the subsequent amending treaties. And it was only in, with the Lisbon Treaty, which was signed in 2007, that this sort of provision for withdrawal was in there. Now, this is Article 50, which of course we heard a lot about back in the uh, beginning of this year. But the thing is, Article 50 is very, very, very limited. Basically, just to say that any member state can indeed withdraw, uh, but uh, withdrawal will involve uh, notifying the European Council of the decision. That's it, yeah. That's the only treaty provision which covers this. And that's, I think, fair enough, because the European Union is a political community. And um, so there are sort of certain basic provisions in the treaties. But beyond that, everything is done through politics, the political process of negotiation. So it's not surprising that we have this long and protracted period of negotiation between the UK and the European Union over um, the, the withdrawal. And, and it has to be said that unwinding and unraveling this tangled web of agreements and provisions and regulations and commitments entered into over 43 years is a major challenge for both sides. Um, as we have seen uh, over the past year, the, the withdrawal negotiations have covered two phases. The first phase, uh, the or divorce bill, if you like, it would involve basically uh, reaching an agreement on how much the UK would pay in order to, to as part of the withdrawal process. Um, and then the second phase, of course, is currently under negotiation um, with pressure on both sides to complete the negotiations by the autumn. And this, of course, is, is really a, a very tense and intense time. Uh, and we have seen indeed that uh, the current negotiations reflect slow progress, mutual irritation, sometimes a lack of comprehension on one side or the other, a game playing and, and then rising frustration on the part of the EU negotiators. And I think it's clear um, 
whether or not, I mean, some sort of deal has to be reached by, by autumn, but it's clear that nonetheless, the UK is likely to be intertwined with the EU um, for a number of, of years going into the future, notwithstanding this two year um, the transition phase after that. Okay, so that's kind of like the background. But what from that background, I want to just look at sort of the implications of Brexit for for research, for the research community in the UK, for participation in research programs. Now, um, it's worth remembering that this year, on the 21st of May, Theresa May, the Prime Minister, said that the UK would like the option to fully associate with the excellence-based uh, European research programs. That's what she said. I mean, it's really not clear yet uh, how this is, is going to play out, but we have to see that the stakes are high. And the stakes are high because the UK has been a member of the European research programs from the beginning. Now, this is the beginning of the research programs was the mid 1980s. And over the years since then, the UK has extended its participation in projects and has also uh, done well in terms of finance. So, uh, in fact, currently the UK is the second largest recipient of research funds after Germany. So, of the total EU research budget, uh, the UK gets just over 15%, 15.2% to be precise, of the total funds, and that would be 15.2% of the 77 billion euros in the horizon 2020. Germany so it gets a little bit more at 16.7. I should also say that in a lot of the projects that are funded where the UK is one of the participants or indeed a lead, uh, you find a lot of uh, German partners as well. Um, okay, um, so that's kind of like, I suppose, the, the, the financial story, but it's not just the financial story because what the UK has um, over the years built up a, a very strong level of participation in in the European research programs, and this has been, uh, you know, with uh, good quality projects that have been put forward by the UK uh, as lead coordinators, and also been able to participate in good quality projects with other European partners. So this is no uh, small thing. I should also say, and I think it's worth us remembering, that uh, the UK, as a member of the European Union, has um, played a very significant part in shaping the structure and the design and the strategic priorities. Of, of the EU research program. And I must say that if you look at, let's say, the research priorities in the EU at the present time and, and what is coming through in the next program, which is uh, Horizon Europe, which will start in 2021, you see the priorities there. And actually, there are the same or similar priorities in the UK research programs and including in the global challenges research fund so so there's a lot of synergies going on there let me say something about mobility um, and of course the mobility issue um, comes up because of this uh, concern in the uk at the present time with migration and we can see that in the lead up to the referendum in 2016 you know migration was a big thing and you know was that bus with all the numbers and so on and so forth which didn't of course turn out to be true but anyway um, migration was a, a key concern and so of course the government after the referendum has kind of run with that agenda to a greater or lesser extent now okay there is a little bit of toing and froing on the part of the government but there is also this enormous political fear that if we don't do something about migration, well, there will be dire consequences for the Conservative Party, that is. Um, so, so, you know, from after 2016, the government has been so really trying to, to kind of cut the numbers uh, in terms of mobility. Um, this has proved politically difficult in the context of uh, European Union citizens, uh, but in fact we've also seen a lot of confusion and uncertainty uh, over um, uh, the, the position of EU researchers, EU citizens, living in the UK. Now, the joint report, which was that report agreed between the UK and the EU uh, in December 2017, had a, a statement there 
basically that a common understanding has been reached on securing the residency rights of EU nationals currently living in the UK. Um, and the cutoff point for this agreement is March 2019. I mean, it's really quite difficult to actually see what this means in practice. Um, and there have been some uh, developments since then in terms of uh, the treatment of EU researchers, EU citizens living in the UK. So those with settled status um, uh, will be able to, to, to sort of live in the UK for up to five years. And then in terms of recruiting EU and, and EA, European Economic Area staff in the longer term, uh, any changes in immigration requirements <laughs> will depend on the kind of relationship which the EU negotiates with the EU, uh, th sorry, with the UK negotiates with the EU. So, so there's still, I think, some uh, uncertainties there. Um, and it's worth kind of remembering that uh, the UK, according to data from HESA, um, shows the the UK has 43,000 EU staff members and 125,000 EU students. So we're talking about a lot of uh, numbers here. Um, and, and I think there's going to be quite a bit of um, uh, difficulty over, over, over that. Um, the, the final sort of area that I wanted to mention here concerns international students. Now, this is international non-EU students. And uh, I suppose in terms of, um, you know, this sort of political priority for migration, for cutting the costs, or cutting the numbers of migrants, the, um, the UK government is, is tending to favour what it sees as a more open door in terms of international students, i.e. from outside the EU. This, of course, is problematic at a lot of levels. Um, of course, there is the fact of the enormous contribution that international students make to, uh, to the UK economy, if you wish, uh, but also, of course, in terms of the contribution, and in our case, is perhaps more important, the contribution that international students make to, to research uh, and to the, the sort of uh, uh, cultural and uh, educational uh, aspects of, of the student experience. And, and I think this is very important uh, for, um, for the university. So, um, what, so I, I think, uh, I know somebody sort of said a moment ago about optimism. I, I find the situation right now to be very confusing. Uh, the political, um, uh, so, the, so the message is coming from the political negotiations. I'm not actually that optimistic. I do fear for the um, uh, the negotiations in terms of uh, the, the sort of image that has been presented uh, from, uh, from the <coughs> negotiators, um, and and I think. Uh, this uh, is creating uncertainty, obviously, for the UK university sector. It's creating uncertainty for uh, international students who want to come to the UK or students who want to go from the UK elsewhere. And it's creating, obviously, uncertainty in terms of research projects, both applications to uh, the framework program, but also, of course, possibilities for other kinds of research collaboration. Um, so what are the options? Well, um, I mean, some universities are, some UK universities are already considering uh, new kinds of arrangements and new kinds of uh, bilateral arrangements uh, or uh, bilateral plus one. University of Warwick, for instance, is collaborate, setting up a collaboration with VUB in, in Brussels, and also Sion Co <coughs> is linked into that as well. And, and this is a sort of, well, in this case, a tripartite collaboration to build um, research infrastructures where they can uh, 
pursue research projects and also other kinds of things like doctoral training and so on. So, so this is one uh, kind of possibility. Uh, it is a possibility, I think, that, that uh, yeah, it can be done, but I think it, these, these sorts of things take time. Uh, in, the, in the particular example that I've given you, uh, I know that these three partners have actually been collaborating together for uh, actually since 2005. Yeah, So they know each other and there's already uh, layers of, of, of engagement that they can build on. Um, uh, I suppose there's another thing about these, by, these kind of bilateral and university to university infrastructures, and that is that um, uh, what sort of scale is possible in terms of the activities. Um, and the scale is, I think, likely to be limited in, in comparison with the kinds of big uh, research projects that were feasible under Horizon 2020. You know, we could have a research project of 20 par participants, 20 institutions, up to 40 or, or more. Um, the, the other possibility, uh, and, and this is where I will end, is, um, uh, you know, the UK is likely, and indeed it should, uh, look towards uh, research communities internationally. I mean, there is a, a growing um, uh, and a very uh, competent and very professional and very advanced research community in China and indeed in East Asia generally. Um, but uh, again, uh, the question would be to build critical mass. This, Things take time. The, the UK was in the, in, involved in the European Research Programme since 1986, so and, and that, you know, obviously was time to build up collaboration. Um, I, and then just the other thing to sort of say, um, well, it's kind of repeating a point I made earlier, uh, and that is the, the sort of uh, ambivalence of the UK government towards. Uh, let's say, international students, I think does add to this uncertainty. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks again for organizing this. It's great to see this amazing room, if, if nothing else. Uh, so I'm going to give, a, I suppose, a relatively positive uh, twist on things in terms of Brexit as um, an opportunity or an intellectual stimulus for, for research. I've called it here euphemistically a real-life case study across many uh, social science disciplines, which is not a euphemism for catastrophe. It's, it's just <laughs> something else. Uh, now, Brexit is obviously primarily a, a political uh, fact, and I'll talk about that, but I think it relates to uh, a great many disciplines and sub-disciplines uh, across our faculty. So I'm just going to go through some of them, uh, many of which I have no formal qualifications in, but hey, this is 2018, so very much in the, in the spirit of the times, and um, talk about how Brexit might affect uh, research topics or what, uh, what, how it could be a, a learning, uh, learning process. Economics, first of all, and trade, trade economics is obviously a massive part of the media and, and intellectual uh, debate. Uh, and what we find here really is that the vast majority of, of academics and, and professional economists and think tankers and so on are, are basing their studies, their, their negative studies on the uh, economic impact of Brexit on, I mean, called it the gravity model, which basically looks at the importance of trade in terms of the distance between trading partners and the size, the population and market size of a, of a, a trading partner. Uh, so in the UK's case, that means that the European Union, which is very big, but also very near right next door, is extraordinarily important, whereas China is very big, but further uh, away. Um, and that's uh, essentially at, at the root a lot of, of, of these uh, negative predictions, they vary, but they're all very negative about the economic implications of, of Brexit. Uh, the minority, the economists for free trade, Patrick Minford would be the best known of them. They have a more, more abstract, I think you call it neoclassical kind of free trade model about how all trade barriers can be reduced 
in the UK and through unilateral free trade you can have a great stimulus to, to productivity and, uh, and so on. <coughs> so this, if there is a relatively hard Brexit, and I'm still not, I'm not convinced this will happen, I'm, I'm still not convinced any of this will really happen, but, but we'll see. If there is a hard Brexit in terms of the UK leaving the single market and the customs union, this will be the, the ultimate uh, uh, test uh, of that. Another, of course, element of economics is this is very much political economy and the original uh, Brexiteer idea was that they could uh, persuade the, the European unions to grant them roughly equivalent market access that, that, that the UK has now. Uh, but politically, uh, I think we're seeing this as a, a non-runner. Political risk, uh, it's an area we normally, I think, associate with say large, maybe large energy companies, BP doing business in Algeria or somebody running a, a mine in the, in, in the Congo, something like that. But Brexit has really shown that you know, political risk is an issue for all types of, of companies, including small to medium sized ones. So if you're a small enterprise that, that exports to Europe, you're really now um, 11 months away or fewer even of not knowing <laughs> Uh, what the tariffs or other barriers uh, might be. Uh, there's always, of course, the prospects of looking for uh, looking further afield to wider markets. A lot of these are, are riskier than, than Europe for various reasons, and legal culture, business and political culture as well, as well as you've got to deal with the end of European funding, which probably will be replaced. But if you're a Cornish based SME, it mightn't be uh, it, it, it mightn't be as skewed towards your interests uh, as it has been. Public relations, obviously a massive issue as well. Uh, we all noted last week about Airbus coming out with a very strong statement. Um, Airbus, you can't really have a, a consumer boycott of, of Airbus, obviously, you can't really, I'm not buying another A350 uh, kind of liner. So that, that gives it a slightly different position. Most companies have, have been quiet, uh, quieter than I originally uh, expected, uh, but there are some interesting case studies, Tim Martin and Weatherspoons, Dyson, obviously, and it would be very interesting, in fact, to look at if, and see if politics are affecting uh, consumer choice. Probably most Remainers don't uh, drink in Wetherspoons, but I know some academics that, that did, and I'm, I'm pretty sure the Remainers, so do a, a study of that. Human resources, and I won't think too much about this, it's not my, my area, but I do know anecdotally that, that some organisations, particularly the NHS, you, you've got quite a lot of tension between those that supported Brexit and those often of, say, uh, European, wider European extraction that are taking it very personally indeed, and others that think that Brexit could, could destroy the, the NHS. So you've got real tensions that perhaps we're not so used to in most uh, developed countries. Uh, obviously, specific issues about the rights of employees, and indeed, in the future, how to attract employees from Europe and how to get, get the best talent for, for British universities and so on. Within the university sector itself, I mean, I haven't met anybody from the University of Plymouth that uh, has told me they, they voted to leave, but obviously must be, most people have, but it's clearly a minority view. Uh, broader public policy, a piece of research I'm interested in doing with uh, Richard Saundry, um, amongst others, uh, just based on the fact that uh, if there's a Brexit goes through, it seems at least in areas like agriculture and fishing and possibly many other areas, there will be new forms of regulation uh, coming in, process of, of re-regulation. Uh, and what this means is that lots of uh, agencies, professional associations, local governments are going to have to get their act together in terms of lobbying and in terms of trying to shape this, what's replacing the, the system that is being, being altered. Uh, legal study, obviously there's a massive uh, range of, of legal issues uh, and in fact you can think of Brexit as after a political issue, a legal issue uh, first and foremost. I mean what struck me is areas about contract law, how you Brexit proof contracts and for ongoing contracts between suppliers and to what extent uh, Brexit, if it involves tariffs and new barriers, is a, is a cause for a change in that or, and so on. Uh, Obviously, international trade law is, 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 is a massive area. What the UK government is, is looking for is some kind of broad alignment with European rules, 
where UK businesses are still considered uh, compliant with the broader European kind of legal acquis in, uh, in terms of product standards, health and safety, social standards, environmental standards, and so on, uh, but without following it uh, in, the, in the nitty gritty of it. Uh, roughly speaking, this is called equivalence versus the, the European method, which to have, is to have a degree of harmonization with some common laws and the European Commission and the court policing it and so on. Uh, so Brexiteers are, are hoping that they can get this kind of equivalence, but uh, not, not sure. Citizens' rights, obviously, is, is a massive area as well. And it's not clear to me, it's, it's not my area, but you know, what would really happen in the case of a hard Brexit? Uh, to what extent would British citizens in other EU countries really lose all rights or would they have acquired some uh, almost indirectly? Again, uh, I don't know, but it, it strikes me as a very interesting area. Hopefully that one won't be tested out. Hopefully yeah, I could, could get chucked out of the UK as well, obviously. Um, <laughs> sociology, I mean, criminology, obviously there's a lot, if you look at the case of, of uh, the island of Ireland and borders and bordering and there's already been a lot of work done on that but how this new new break in which uh, the UK uh, breaks away from the mainstream European legal and political system how that might impact on ordinary people all kinds of issues about identity obviously and how different identities overlap um, they may not conflict but in, in the case of Brexit obviously there is a sense of, of British and, and English identity certainly that is is conflicting with the, the European mainstream. Uh, minority rights and uh, hate crimes, and again, there is an element of, of populism to, to Brexit, and there's obviously an element of, of xenophobia and of racism to, to populism, and there have been an increase in hate crimes, and there may well be concerned that in, in this new world, vulnerable communities may be uh, even more vulnerable. So again, that's important work to be done. And last but not least, politics, obviously, uh, apart from Brexit being a political act, it raises a lot of interesting questions about how we do democracy in, in the UK, uh, particularly this phrase, the, the will of the people, that's, that keeps coming up, which is from a vote that was 52%, uh, 48%. Uh, this is what we call you know, majoritarianism uh, versus other kinds of democratic validation, where you might have to have a majority in each of the nations of the UK, for example, or you might have to have a super majority as it's such uh, a dramatic process and so on. Uh, but anyway, it's been the, the UK, like the United States, in fact, has something of a, a winner takes all approach to democracy where you you win and it's over to you <laughs> then get to try and pursue your your aims to the, to the maximum. Uh, that's it's not the continental uh, European way. What we're seeing played out in Parliament, of course, is popular will, uh, or so, so declared popular will versus representational democracy and how much uh, autonomy MPs should have. Traditionally in the UK, quite a lot of it is a parliamentary uh, democracy. We've also got very interesting changes in traditional political tensions, although the, the parties still exist, but they're clearly fractured and the difference is not the standard socioeconomic left wing right wing, this difference in the, the acceptance of what I call transnationalism here, or things like free movement, or the idea of pan-European law and so on. And, and this is cutting across people saying the Conservative Party, who might have some quite similar socio-economic views. Uh, so, so this is an interesting area to look at. Uh, international relations, so many, I won't dwell on this, but obviously Brexit is an example of disintegration. Uh, there are some historical examples, obviously of countries breaking up, but this isn't the same thing, or of currency unions breaking up. Uh, there are also examples of it. It's not pretty pretty either. The case study of different forms of power. The, the UK is uh, obviously a very powerful state by any normal uh, reckoning, uh, but in this situation that, it, that it's come into, you, you can see thus far, I think, at least that it's completely out, outmatched by the, the EU machine and is, is outmaneuvered. Uh, the EU is setting the agenda constantly and the UK is, is giving ground slowly just about uh, everywhere. Uh, but a link between politics and economics. I've been interested in the lack of influence of 
big business on UK decision making, including the City of London that, that hasn't. Uh, we, we thought for many years that it was controlling UK foreign policy, for, for better or worse. I think it, it's clear that it's not, at least in a, in a case like this. And just as a, as a final section, I want to say a little bit, but mostly, obviously, we've got young academics and, and, and slightly less young uh, here. Uh, but Brexit and, and the, the role of the, of the academic and this idea of public engagement and the, the kind of challenges that, that emerge here. Uh, doing kind of media work, you know, doing say local media work for BBC Devon or something like that. Um, like, what do they want from an academic expert? Do they just want sometimes somebody with letters before their name who can summarise uh, an issue and then let others discuss it? To what extent are you allowed to give your own opinion? You can't be, be unbiased totally about something uh, like, like Brexit. Um, it's a sensitive area, but, but how to deal with what might be outright lies or is more common kind of half-truths and then limited truths in, in the Brexit uh, debate. Now, I should say on, on the Remain side, there were you know, many exaggerations and so on. And some people with a, uh, an unrealistically uh, starry-eyed view of the EU that you know, there's no democracy problem there. And that when the EU says the talks are going badly, that must be all the UK's fault, that's not necessarily the, the case, obviously. Um, but by the Leave campaign, you had these more egregious, what we say, uh, alternative facts or challenges to what we know of as, as facts, most notably the famous bus. Now, you, can, you could say uh, definitively, I think, that 350 million was wrong, whether you want to say it's a lie or a falsehood or a mistake is you know, debatable, but can, as an academic, say that's wrong. Uh, other statements, though, are logically true, but you know, possibly misleading. So it's certainly true that leaving the single market and customs union allows different choices to the UK. That's, you know, that's logically uh, impeccable. Whether it would lead to a better economic outcome, again, from, from my perspective, uh, as a political science, scientist, and as most economists would say, almost certainly not. But how do you how do you deal with this as, a, as an academic? How do you explain the, the basis for, for what you're arguing? How you deal with complexity, really? Uh, always an issue to think about how your research might be used. Uh, some poor character did one report on for the European Parliament on uh, uh, invisible borders. It was just kind of speculative, but he's found himself used by every Brexit here. Now, in the case of the, there's no problem in Northern Ireland at all because of this this one article. So he's probably getting a lot of citations as well as possibly a lot of abuse. But again, that's something to think about. And just to end, really, again, real time events like Brexit do obviously challenge the way academics do things. You know, what's the average timeline? For a, a journal, it's probably not under a year to send something off and get it published and so on that. So it's likely to be out of date. So this is already happening, of course, but we need to be using things like blogs, social media, with a lot of course cons to that and a lot of dangers as, as well, uh, apart from getting into a slanging match with Piers Morgan or whoever. You know, there's uh, academics are very much encouraged to be, you know, active and put their views out there, but but it can be problematic in different ways as well. Working papers are obviously a reasonable uh, compromise, something that's you know, academically worked out and, and rigorous, but can be, can be produced before your, your book or your journal article. And uh, that's it really for me, apart from to repeat the old cliche about that, that it is interesting times and research has never been more important. So that in a sense is, is for researchers positive, even if for uh, the world in general, it, it might not be that contradiction. I'll, I'll leave it. <laughs> Questions from Patrick? Well, uh, seeing that you said that Cork and I here, as 
thought was interesting was it was an aside, it was I didn't think it would happen, but I just wondered if you'd like to elaborate on that. Yeah, well, I think that the UK economically, because of, as Mary explained, how Article 50 works, has gotten himself, itself in a very weak position. And even though they're, they're now obviously ignoring and resentful of, of businesses, if more businesses start to uh, may take tangible actions, and if there are fears even of something like a capital flight, we're heading for a no deal. I still believe that in the Conservative Party, including Theresa May, if she can break free of her kidnappers. There are people that would just extend Article 50 uh, rather than have uh, really a quite chaotic situation. Nobody knows what it would be like um, if there were no deal and it could even be an opportunity for some people, uh, but, but not for most. And it's, uh, it's hard to imagine the, the British government actually doing it, although it could, could well happen. So in that case, they, they could uh, the government could collapse for various reasons, a split within the Conservative Party or with the DUP, and there could be a new political formation, perhaps, again, just if I can imagine a Labour Lib Dem uh, coalition, and the Lib Dem say we want a referendum on, you know, either rejoining or not fully leaving, and Labour may be not being that displeased as having it taken out of their hands, saying yes. So that's just the kind of scenario. It's not, as you say, it's not the most likely I think the most likely one is something like the very begrudging Norway scenario where the UK agrees to take on a lot of the laws, but pretends that it isn't, there's something like that. Uh, but, but it's not impossible uh, that Brexit could be somehow stopped or, or reversed. Because I mean, I've always thought that uh, you know, the interest of business might be a very significant driver. Yeah, yeah, and that's why I mentioned for a standard, either possibly a liberal or a Marxist, you know, political economist, they would be surprised by what's happened because they would think the business wouldn't allow it somehow. But what Brexit has shown, it is actually a good thing, is that politics is autonomous, not maybe terribly constructive in this case, but you know, politics isn't just doing what, what business dictates, at least in the short term. But I'm inclined to believe it will kick in one way or another over time. There was one after the back there. Thank you. Yes. Uh, my question is very simple. It's very complete justice to the topic. And my own concern is about trade. And uh, what, what do you think is the impact of Brexit on trade in line with you look at the how London is financial center with New York. Do you think London will retain its, uh, its that position in the next few decades? Or is it losing to other European members like uh, Germany? So, or also Paris? Do you think London will still retain a position as a financial center? Or if you think it's not going to lose it? I should say in this post-truth age, I'm not a professor, actually. But, uh, but thanks, I'll accept the, the promotion. Um, yeah, not, neither my expert in financial services. Most experts reckon that London will be the biggest single financial centre in, in Europe, regardless of even in a hard Brexit, because it is a global centre. But it would obviously lose a lot of, of business, its euro clearing and so on. So it, again, depends what Brexit is, but that's the general prediction would be possibly reduced by you know 30 40 percent but still the greatest single one what that means for the uk government and its revenue those um, i don't know did you uh, uh, yeah it's just to add to that um the, the city institutions have already made plans for post-brexit and quite a number of them have opened offices in paris and or in Frankfurt. So I think there has been a, a downgrading 
of uh, you know, some of the operations of London. Uh, quite how it will go out and pan out in the future, uh, we have to wait and see what kind of agreement the UK will eventually make with the European Union. Our question for Professor Farrell. Um, do you imagine it, or does the UK government give a commitment to match fund um, UK universities that are in partnership with EU, EU universities in receipt of funds? Um, yes, th this was uh, this was something which was made um, when was it? Uh, uh, maybe in the autumn of 2018. Uh, uh, no, sorry, 2017. Yeah, because at that stage um, it wasn't clear um, what the position of uh, the UK researchers was in relation to applications and the training program. And uh, so some universities had already made certain commitments and were working on proposals, uh, projects that they were going to submit for um, February of this year. So, um, so the UK government, yeah, it actually uh, gave a guarantee to underwrite uh, certain uh, commitments. Uh, in in the end, it didn't become uh, well. It was written into the joint report, which was published in December. Yeah, so that's not ongoing. That was just like yes, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Just the period up to yeah. <coughs> <laughs> I noticed over the weekend, and in part you mentioned about the sort of conflict between Remainers and, and uh, Leavers, etc. The sort of potential for a surge in that. And over the weekend, there was huge amounts of really quite nasty stuff going around about the march in London. I just wondered whether you have any sort of reflections in relation to whether you think that the, the was going to the more grassrootsy, called grassrootsy sort of pro-remain campaigning marches, etc. Whether that had any mileage in it whatsoever, or is it a, you know, a completion at a uh, waste of time? Um, yeah, no, I think it it has to be done if there's any possibility of mitigating or or reversing Brexit. So even though there, there are risks, of course, there's going to be tension and anger, but. There's going to be tension and anger anyway. That's that's the way I I see it. Assembly voters won't be very happy at whatever final deal is is made. It probably won't even reduce migration, and certainly won't reduce it from outside Europe, which is what animates uh, some of these people as well. So the way I see it is we're we're in a kind of angry time uh, anyway. We're we're not going back to more uh, kind of uh, we say traditionally British subdued, uh, passive aggressive. Uh, behavior. So, and Twitter is Twitter is, is fascinating and it's worth doing research on just the, the kind of stuff that, that comes out there, good and bad, most mostly bad. But no, I think it's it's giving a, a, an excuse and a, and a lever for politicians possibly to to change their mind. Uh, yeah, just given, given what you said about the about the fact that Brexit in a way was a uh, Evidence that perhaps some of the traditional drivers of political decision making or political outcomes like business interests have been shown to be maybe less surprisingly influential in, in this situation. Do you think that there is more chance that a sort of popular protest or you know, the views of those people who, who want to remain will have more influence in terms of the eventual outcome? Yeah, I don't know if you can say it will have more influence. It won't be enough on, on its own, as particularly Remainers mostly aren't the kind of people that are going to, to riot in the streets or, or anything like that. So, so they're showing um, that there's a real kind of basis to the, the anti-Brexit movement, uh, but it would have to be with, with business and, and traditional politics uh, as well. What do you think you were at? Yeah, um, I mean, it's interesting that uh, while the march on Saturday was well attended, uh, but uh, the numbers weren't anything like uh, turned out to oppose Tony Blair's decision to go to war yeah. against Iraq when there was a million people. So I don't know why that was. It was a very sunny day and people just didn't want to go 
go to the center of the city or, or whatever. Um, and yes, I, I think it's true. Maybe the remainers are, are yeah, not so gung ho about uh, opposing. Um, but but certainly, uh, you know, uh, if there if there were to be a mass mobilization, uh, it would want to happen pretty soon because we're already quite far down the road. Now, of course, maybe behind the scenes, um, in the negotiations, maybe deals are being done or move, there's movement towards a much softer Brexit, uh, but that we're not getting any kind of sense of that because of the political sensitivities and the, the sort of unwillingness of the prime minister to, to sort of yeah, to take big risks or to be to appear to be taking big risks. I think the the prime minister's position is is actually not very helpful because there is the prime minister on one side, and over there are all the um, conservative members of the government, and there doesn't seem to be a, a strong support. By the prime minister uh, uh, in the cabinet, and I think that makes it, it uh, difficult for her to to maybe be more forthcoming about what is happening and and where the government wants to take things. So so there isn't uh, really uh, considering the the seriousness of the, well the implications of of a decision. Uh, there's very little um, public communication. There's very little um, uh, sort of indications from uh, the prime minister about uh, what is happening. And I think this is actually uh, certainly not good in democratic terms and probably just uh, not a good way to do things. It certainly doesn't build trust or confidence. Back to the research focus. Um, when you mentioned social media, blogging, and the pros and cons, was the implication what you were saying? That yes, it concerns around very much quicker, but maybe there's a question mark over the validity problems the research um, and perhaps you know given shorter times um, less opportunity for a validation of what's being written evaluation and so forth is that part of it? could be although that's maybe more sophisticated even i was thinking i was thinking you could just end up getting involved in like a, um, all kinds of micro controversies or disputes between you know, can become the, the the target particularly on something like brexit you can get a lot of abuse thrown your way that's not the reason not to do it but but people should be be aware of it and also there is the, the danger of, of, of talking down to people as well in different senses when you get involved in that but as well as that there's of course it can be superficial and because like I said, it is a complex issue so it's not that the, the EU is necessarily wonderful and you can get in the trap of just arguing or seeming like you're arguing that if you're arguing you know, so people, you know, so in other words, um, sort of retreating into silos rather than actually sharing research in quite. No, I think way. I think sharing is is not really under uh, under threat, and of course now with this much greater emphasis on open access, I think this is a route. Uh, I think in the context of Brexit, the fact that uh, there is this very short time frame combined with the, the sort of very limited information coming through about the nature of the negotiations. So I think that's where the problem is. But um, in terms of, let's say, social media and so on, I think one interesting model of research is uh, that of the um, this research project, which has been run from King's College by Anon Menno, uh, the UK and the Changing Europe. Um, and this is a research project which is, that is, is funded by the ESRC and was launched um, 2014 or 2015, but before, um, before the referendum. And 
the, the ESOC had this idea to set up a research program uh, around the UK and the change in Europe. But of course, the ESOC didn't predict the June 2016 referendum. So it was less the case of the UK and the change in Europe and more a question of the changing UK in Europe. And, um, and now the, the project, I think, is interesting because uh, the, um, the project leader and everybody involved have, have sort of managed to, um, to deal with that bombshell which was thrown at them because when they wrote their research project and when the ESOC agreed to fund it and it's got a substantial amount of funding um it was a, it was a, you know the world was like this EU 28 no indication that um that the UK was going to leave so it was a, a project which the ESOC wanted to fund just as it funded back in the 1980s a big project on the single market program which generated lots and lots of publications and research, small research projects and large research projects so so this was supposed to be let's say the latest phase of the esrc's funding of uh, projects and european integration and, and the uk's place and all of that so so of course uh, became a different ball game altogether. And, and it's very interesting how this project is, is, um, is now running. I would really recommend you have a look at their website. But there's a, lot of, there's a lot of use of social media. There's a lot of use of Twitter. There's a lot of engagement with all sorts of research communities, uh, with local authorities, with the regional, at the regional level. Um, lots of talking to uh, the, the people in Whitehall and uh, and essentially trying to 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 have impact and to it to influence policy and to kind of I suppose communicate the ideas from the research community and from different communities not just the research community but different communities around the UK to communicate this uh, to to the government so so I suppose that you know if you're thinking about research projects generally and, and how you organize and how you run them. There's some interesting elements to to that project, I think. Thank you. Thank you.